Hello and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our 12th uh, Blue Health Virtual Seminar. Uh, Blue Health Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management updates of different health-related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blue Health Utopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. We aim to be an influential healthcare leaders in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. I'm going to be your host, Adam Getacho. I'm the co-founder and CTO at Blue Health Utopia. Uh, we are honored to have Dr. Mulalo Mundafrash here with us, uh, and he's going to give us an update on the approach to uh, traumatic head injury. Uh, to give you a little introduction about doc Dr. Mulalo. Uh, Dr. Mulalo is a department head of neurosurgery at St. Paul. He's also an expert, CPI, uh, expert of CPID. In addition to that, he's a neurosurgery assistant professor, and he has been working hospitals and universities uh, like uh, Shasha Mane, House University, Debrezate, St. Paul, and uh, so on. He is also a member of Neurosurgery Society of Ethiopia and uh, also member of IMA. So to give you a little bit introduction about this session, this session is going to last for 90 minutes. We'll begin with the uh, presentation on the approach to traumatic head injury. And after that, there will be a few minutes for Q&A. So I think uh, I've taken enough time for the introduction. Uh, doctor, uh, you can take the stage. Thank you very much. So today we're going to see about the approach to head injury patients. So hopefully most of you are health professionals. So it won't be like our lectures where we talk about mechanism, pathophysiology, and so on. This will be more of focused on the patient. And specifically how we go about it will be, you know, from the trauma side, we'll try to follow the patient. For example, we're gonna start discussing one pre-hospital care and then things we do to, when the patient arrives at the emergency department and then ICU. But basically one thing I want you guys to know is that all the care and the principle is the same in the three places, but it's more, it gets more advanced as the patient passes through these stations. So by the end of the session, minimum, bare minimum, I, I ask of you to know which patients to admit and to pick which patients require surgical intervention. So in between the sessions, I'm gonna show you our clinical practice so that you guys be informed about where neurosurgery in Ethiopia is. So basically this is a patient who I operated on while I was a resident. He fell down from a construction site head first and onto the stick you see here. And we took CT scan, you can clearly see that it has penetrated the skull bolt and it has injured the right eye. So we operated on him and he was dis discharged after one week. Only he had visual loss on the right side. So when we come to the basic anatomy, everyone knows the scalp bone, and then we have the dura, dural slits contain the dural sinuses, and then we have the arachnoid, which contains blood vessel and CSF, and then we have the pia matter, the gray matter, and white matter. So what are the things we expect from a pre-hospital care? I'm not talking about in our center only, but generally speaking. So everyone knows the primary insult of the head injury cannot be resolved, but we are going to correct or try to prevent secondary injury, which is usually caused by hypoxic insult or hypotension or ischemia. So all the emergencies ICU care will be focusing on managing the secondary injuries. So in terms of uh, management at the pre-hospital care level, of course, we are going to follow the ATLS guideline and primary survey followed by resuscitation, secondary survey and definitive care will be followed. But I will try to discuss mostly things related to head injury. So ABCs of life will follow. Of course, airway should be protected. We check for the response of the patient and then 
if uh, airway is not protected, we apply jaw thrust. Mind you, chin lifts will injure if there is associated cervical injury. We suction the airway if there are foreign bodies or any secretions, and we apply oropharyngeal airways. When we come to intubation, most researchers currently don't recommend intubation at site of injury because intubation should be done by experts, the most expert professional, because it's going to be difficult. And most of the patients may be intubated while on their way. You can imagine intubating a patient on an ambulance or, for that matter, on a helicopter. But generally speaking, this is less than eight requires our intubations. Also, these patients are clearly at risk of aspiration. So as I said earlier, it's not recommended to intubate patients on the pre-hospital care. In terms of techniques or drugs, it's better to use short-acting benzodiazepines or opioids or propofol because we want to monitor the GCS as well. Okay, so the mom, after finishing the intubation and so on, patients should start to be at least reactive, try to localize and so on. Otherwise, the GCS assessment will be difficult if we give them long-acting benzodiazepines. Regarding ketamine, ketamine is excellent in cases of hemodynamically unstable patients, but it has, as you know, hallucination effect. So when you assess GCS in a patient who is intubated with ketamine, you may be having difficulty. So in terms of uh, breathing, airway breathing, we need to give oxygen 100%. We need to rule out possible tension in motorax and treat it accordingly. And our target oxygen level should be 90% or partial pressure of uh, oxygen. If we have arterial line and so on, it should be more than 60. So in terms of circulation, we check for perfusion and uh, blood pressure, heart rate, we will check our target Systolic blood pressure is more than or equal to 100 for this age range and more than 110 for extremes of age. So basically speaking, uh, strictly speaking, if we have hypotension in an isolated severe TBI patient, we should not attribute that to the head injury, okay? Because it's, it really causes hypotension. So the exceptions will be infants because they have low blood volume or patients with extensive scalp wounds like more than 10 centimeters. Otherwise, if you have hypotension with head injury, look for other sources of blood loss like polytrauma or they may have underlying high cervical trauma. So don't try to attribute this to head injury. So choice of resuscitation fluid. I think you guys already know it should be normal saline or isotonic crystalloids, but hypertonic crystalloids can be used. They have the advantage of reducing intracranial pressure, but when compared in terms of outcome, overall isotonic crystalloids are as good as hypertonic crystalloids. But on the other hand, colloids like albumin, they increase mortality and also glucose-containing fluids. If uh, the patient is not hypoglycemic, they are, they are not recommended. In terms of vasopressor regarding hypotension, of course, initial resuscitation for all hypotensive patients is fluid followed by blood. And then finally, we go ahead with vasoactive agents. The choice most, uh, mostly chosen drug is noradrenaline that phenylephrine control can be used. When we come to the disability part of our ABC of life, we need to assess GCS. But the one thing I urge you is whenever you assess the GCS of patients, please make sure that the patient is not hypoxic, hypoventilated, hypoglycemic, or there is hypotension because this will disturb your assessment. For example, let's say you have a patient with GCS3, he is hypoxic, you're gonna assume he's already brain dead, but you should correct the hypoxia and then assign a new GCS to prognosticate. Otherwise you will say GCS is three. We don't need to operate on this patient. Also any mind altering drugs like alcohol, narcotics, 
should be out of the patient system to give clear GCS level. Of course, I think we are talking going to transport this patient, right? So we need to apply neck collar according to Nexus criteria. If the patient has neck pain, neck tenderness, or distracting injury like femoral fracture on the other side so that they cannot remember their neck or they are alcohol intoxicated, we should clearly apply neck collar. And we should use spine boards in transport of head injury patients because they are comatous. We don't know if they have neurologic deficit due to the head injury or the spine injury. But mind you, in most of my practice, I have seen that spine board is used to treat these patients even in the emergency. It's, it should not be like that. It should only be used for transfer. So I, I hope you guys don't expect me to go through GCS assessment. You know, it has three components, motor, eye, and verbal component, but rather I think this classification is new for you guys. So I think most of the time mild, moderate and severe head injury classification is used in our daily clinical practice, but they have come up with minimal head injury if the patient has GCS 15, but no loss of consciousness or no amnesia. But if GCS is still 50, but patient has loss of consciousness or memory impaired, automatically they become mild head injury. And then again, if the loss of consciousness is more than five millimeters or patient has neurologic deficits, they become moderate TBI. When we come to hyperventilation, when we come to hyperventilation, so our indication for hyperventilation is only for briefly if we don't have ICP monitor and partial pressure of carbon dioxide should be only 30 to 35 millimeter of mercury. And we think that the patient is gonna die. We don't have any other solutions for, so to buy us time, we can start them on hyperventilation. And mind you, whenever you apply hyperventilation, the patient sometimes may become tetanic or stiff. That may be attributed to seizure, but rather it is due to the binding of ionized calcium to the proteins due to the alkalosis we induce that leads the patient to become tetanic. So hyperventilation, strictly speaking, should not be used as a prophylaxis. We should not keep carbon dioxide less than 30 millimeter of mercury. And it, ideally it should not be used with absence of any of monitors like partial pressure or in the tidal carbon dioxide monitors. And in head injuries, it is advised that within 24 to 48 hours, it's contraindicated due to the vasomotor response pattern of head injury patients. So circulation, the ABC part we already discussed, maybe the only exception is if the patient is hypertensive, we can use nicardipine or beta blockers if the patient is tachycardic. In terms of disability, we also discussed already this part, light sedation and seizure prophylaxis should be applied. So early use of uh, paralytic and uh, sedation prior to ICP monitoring. Uh, if we are using sedations right and left paralytics for all patients, we are going to end up with patients with pneumonia, prolonged ICU stay, and sometimes even sepsis. So only sedation and paralysis should be applied to patients with confirmed ICP or who uh, are restless. So in terms of E, we added excess glucose level. As you know, hyperglycemia in ICU has poor outcome. Also patients with fever, may, we may end up with increased baseline metabolism and requiring us more uh, feeding. So in terms of gastric ulcer or Cushing ulcer, we should put them on omeprazole. And hypothermia is not statistically proven, but if it is used, it should be used for more than 48 hours to get the benefits. So basically by now, we have handled the general aspect of this patient. The next step will be to take CT scan of the patient if it is indicated. Okay, so before we proceed to the admission and imaging criteria of our, our patients, I want to share with you, we also do spine cases like this herniated spine discs. This is 
a patient with vertebral body fracture, we applied radical screws. So the one drug, if you have to know about in the emergency is manitol. And the funny thing is the exact mechanism how manitol works in head injury patient is not known. That these are possible mechanisms that are forwarded. One is by lowering ICP. This is due to, it is osmotic nature. It will set a new osmotic gradient that leads to withdrawal of cerebral edema. The other possible mechanisms is it supports microcirculation by improving blood rheology. That means their RBC deformity level will be improved so that they can pass through the smallest blood vessel available. And also it has decided to have some freezer radical scavenging component. In terms of indication in manitol, manitol use, it should be used in diagnosed raised intracranial hypertension patients. There is evidence, if there is evidence of massive like focal deficit or there is sudden deterioration of GCS, so we are taking the patient to the CT scan, we need time, we apply a monitor. At the same time, if there are features of raised ICP on the CT scan, as well as before surgery, as you know, the OR may be occupied, so you start them on monitor and then you take your time. Maybe the new exception will be this checking salvageability of patients. So as I said earlier, if patients come to you with bilateral dilator fixed people, GCS is three, you have to decide whether to operate or not, whether to intubate or not. So we check with manitol, we load them with manitol and check for brain stem reflexes. If the brain stem reflexes are apparent, we go ahead with our further management. But mind you, as any drug, manitol is not 100% safe. So we need to avoid using combined corticosteroids and phenytoin with manitol, as well as if the patient has renal problem or if the patient has high serum osmolarity, we are gonna induce acute renal failure by giving manitol. Also, it is contraindicated for, for hypotensive patients or patients with congestive heart failure. So as we said earlier, post-traumatic seizure is one of the complications of head injury. It can be classified into early and late post-traumatic seizure. Early is if it occurs in less than seven days. Late is if it occurs more than seven days. The only power as a physician we have is to control or to use prophylaxis against only early post-traumatic seizures. Otherwise, less late post-traumatic seizures, we may not have prophylaxis for them, or there is no evidence that supports patients should be on anti-epileptics for a long time. So as a guideline, this is if we have patients with subdural, epidural, intracerebral hematoma, skull fractures, penetrating brain injury, we should start them on anti-epileptics for seven days, mind you, because the only one we can protect is for the first seven days. But on the other hand, if patients have penetrating head injury, development of late post-traumatic seizure, or they have history of prior seizure, or they are going to undergo craniotomy, the recommendation is they should continue to take the anti-epileptics for six to 12 months. Tapering and stopping of the drugs only is recommended after EEG has been done. So now you have evaluated your patient, you have handled the general complications and so on. Now we are about to decide, should we do CT scan? Should we do, should we admit the patient and so on? So this confusion can be cleared by these three categories. So basically at the end of your clerking, your patient should lie either as low risk, moderate risk or high risk. And your management will be based on that. So low risk patients basically are asymptomatic. They have only headache, dizziness, and some scalp condition and so on. And they have no moderate or high risk criteria. These patients can be automatically discharged and sent home. While moderate risk patients, they will tell you, the attendants will tell you there is loss of consciousness or the patient himself can tell you progressive headache or the patient is, if the patient is al alcohol intoxicated, you cannot differentiate whether the cause is the alcohol or change in GCS, so you have to, consider this as a moderate risk patient. P 
pediatric patients, if the patient complains of vomiting, post-traumatic amnesia, if the patient has multiple trauma, they should be considered as moderate risk. So what's the significance of moderate risk classifying patients as a moderate risk? They have up to 46% chance of having at least hemorrhagic contusion. So in such patients, we need to take CT scan. We need to do observation, which can be done at home or in the hospital. While high-risk patients, you can just directly see the patient and decide because these patients will have depressed level of consciousness. They will have focal neurologic deficit and they may, there may be signs and symptoms of penetrating skull injuries. These patients, I think it's clear, we need to admit them, if not into the ICU, get an enhanced CT scan as soon as possible. If patient is having focal neurologic finding examination, we need to notify the operating room. We need to tell them we have such and such patients, be prepared, we may go to OR. And in setups where you, you don't have MRI or CT scan, you may be forced to do exploratory holes. So finally, we need to determine in high-risk patients whether they require intracranial monitoring or not, which we will discuss later. So if you discharge the patient, of course, we have to tell them danger signs like uh, Okay, so we have to tell them, you know, initial, we can discharge patients with the following criteria, sorry. So initial GCS should be more than 14. High risk criteria should not be there. Moderate risk should not be there. Patients should be neurologically intact. And there should be an available sober adult who can observe the patient. And they need to be told when to return. So these are the danger signs. We need to tell the attendants to bring the patient whenever they develop this condition. So to update this at St. Paul Hospital, we have prepared this flyer, which is in Amharic and in Oromifa. It all tells about possible danger signs that the patients need to consider. So every time we discharge head injury patients or even post-op patients, we give them this flyer. Okay, so let's say you have moderate TBI and you wanted to observe or admit patients. So we classify them into two, patients with GCS 14, mild TBI or moderate TBI and severe TBI. Mild TBI basically is, all you need to do is support them, head elevation, follow them with neuroscience chart. Especially it will be good if you have ICU available so that because it's frequent monitoring, the ward nurses will not tolerate for paying attention for every one to two hours for one patient. And we need to give them clear fluid because if they deteriorate, we can always take it out by energy tube. And of course, maintenance fluid should be given if we are going to keep them NPO and we should put them on mild analgesics. While for patients with GCS 13 and 15, we need to follow them. Orders are the same but exceptions will be, there should be NPO because any time T, we may go to in, in, into the OR. As we said, they should be admitted to the ICU. And if patient has normal or near normal CT scan on initial evaluation, they should improve. Their GCS should improve within 12 hours. If they don't improve, we need to take another CT scan. So this is another case we operated at St. Paul. You can clearly see there is a mass arising from the posterior dura. I brought the CT scan to show you how calcified this is. And this patient actually, when we operated the dura was so calcified and thick, we had to use drill over the dura just to open and remove it. Of course, he's discharged fine. So in terms of imaging for head injury patients, this is a skull X-ray, which clearly shows linear skull fracture. Also here you see a foreign body, skull X-ray again. So basically skull X-ray in terms of head injury, it's used only for following foreign bodies to see for pneumocephalus or in pediatric patients to see for progress of growing skull fracture. Here, I think everybody knows that there is a biconvex hyperdense lesion 
automatically if there is distress trauma your diagnosis is acute epidural hematoma so the question is do we operate or not and the answer will be any epidural hematoma with volume more than 30 cc should be operated if the volume is less than 30 cc the thickness more than 15 midline shift more than five or GCS less than eight should be operated, okay? So how would I know the volume is 30 cc? We use the ellipse formula. So we measure the diameter in the medial to lateral direction, superior to inferior direction, and anterior to posterior directions. We multiply them and divide them by two. That will roughly estimate the volume for us. So in this case, we have a crescentric-shaped hyperdense lesion. Automatically, I think you guys are screaming out saying acute subdural hematoma. Of course, so what are the indications to operate acute subdural hematoma? If the thickness is more than 10 millimeter or the midline shift is 5 millimeter, we should operate. But if 10 millimeter, less than 10 millimeter and midline shift is less than 5 millimeter, we need to see drop in GCS by two points, or people should be asymmetric or fixed. Or if we are monitoring the ICP, if it is more than 20, we automatically should directly go and operate on these patients. Some authors recommend monitoring ICP for patients with acute subdural hematoma if the GCS is less than nine. So this is our patient suffered from acute subdural hematoma you can see the hematoma this is the dura once you remove the subdural hematoma you can directly see the brain tissue underlying there here you have a hyperdense lesion that follows the salsa and gyri of the brain so you have acute subarachnoid hemorrhage so this is how it will appear under direct vision. When we have hyperdense lesion in the brain parenchyma itself, we call it intraparenchymal or intracerebral hemorrhage. ICH is the abbreviation for that. This particular patient after developing ICH, his GCS dropped, so we had to operate on him. You can clearly see the dark hematoma going out. So, Unlike the subdural hematoma we were discussing, we had to open the brain to access the hematoma and it was removed. Patient was discharged fine. So what are the indications to operate on traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage? So if the patient is having progressive neurologic deterioration or with medical therapy, the intracranial hypertension cannot be controlled, we need to operate or we have traumatic ICH with volume more than 50 cc and patient with GCS 6 to 8 and we have temporal or frontal, mind you, it's not other side, temporal or frontal ICH more than 20 cc. Unlike the 50 cc, we may have to operate or on CT scan, you may see compressed basal cisterns that are indication for surgery. So what are these basal cisterns basically? On your CT scan, you scroll down and find the midbrain that is shaped like this. Any space posterior to it is considered as a basal system. As you can see, there are three limbs. So obliteration of one limb accounts for 33% of raised ICP. You can imagine two limbs will be 66 and three limbs, there will be 99%. So this image shows you posterior fossa hemorrhage because here you see the tentorium is overlying here. So indications to operate posterior fossa hemorrhage include if there is mass effect, but in the posterior fossa, we are not gonna discuss midline shift and so on and so forth. What we have is only a midline located for the ventricle. So we'll see this for the ventricle, if it is dislocated, if there is compression or obliteration, we operate. If the basal systems are obliterated, we operate. Or if the patient is showing signs and symptoms of obstructive hydrocephalus, we need to operate. This image shows you multiple contusions of the brain. 
So here you see there is fluid, fluid level, the CSF, which is low density floats above, and the hyperdense lesion, because the patient, while going into the CT scan, will be lying supine, will go and trickle down to the occipital hole. So you have intraventricular hemorrhage. This patient, you can see the, the loss of gray white differentiation in the ventricle is completely almost obliterated. This is what we have by cerebral edema. This patient underwent decompressive craniotomy, and you can see how the swelling progressed. So if we don't intervene, the gray white loss will increase, the brain becomes hypoxic, and you can see the hypodense nature of the brain parenchyma itself. This is what happens if there is ischemia progressing without intervention. This is to show you most of the time we report basal skull fracture, basal skull fracture, and so on. I don't know how many of you knows how to locate your own CT scan, but it, it's clearly seen here. The basal skull, the petrous bone is fractured here. So this one, I think everybody knows this is a depressed skull fracture. Okay, indications to operate depressed skull fracture include if it is compound or open fractures, if thickness is depressed more than the calvaria. Otherwise, we don't operate for patients with depression less than one centimeter. There is no significant associated intracranial hematoma, no frontal sinus involvement, no gross cosmetic deformity, we don't operate. So this is an image to show you. This is the patient I operated at Hawasa. So you can see the stone is directly impinging on the skull, penetrating directly into the brain parenchyma. The other finding, uh, as we said earlier, if the herniation is not at rest, the ICP is not at rest, progressively patient will develop hypodensity in this occipitoparietal area. This is the vascular distribution for posterior cerebral artery, and this is what kills the patient at the end of the day. So here you see bubble-like structures, multiple hypodense lesions, so these are pneumocephalus, as in the chest, we can have tension pneumocephalus of the brain, as you can see here, if the ball valve mechanism through the breakage of the frontal sinus occurs, you can see the air can push and compress the brain, leading to what we call mount fungin sign. These patients need bare hole and evacuation of the hematoma like we do for chest tube. So if we have hypodense lesions that is crescentric, we automatically know this is subdural. The question is whether it's acute or chronic. If it is hypodense, of course, it's going to be chronic subdural hematoma. So indications for operating chronic subdural hematoma is if the thickness is more than one centimeter or patient has focal deficit, mental state change, or seizure, we need to evacuate it as soon as possible. So this is to show you another experience we are having. So we also operate on spina bifida cases. As you can see, this patient has encephalosis. We operate on hydrocephalus cases as well. So now we are shifting to management of patients in the ICU. So basically, as we said earlier, it's more advanced, but the continuation of the same care that has been given in the emergency. So more of in the ICU, we are going to focus on documented treatment of raised ICP patients, or as I said earlier, for patients who, are, who have uncontrollable ICP, kind of trial or desperate measures like second tire therapy will be implemented. So I keep saying, you know, ICP, ICP, ICP. The reason is that ideally, if I have the instrument, the capacity and so on, it should be the more issue I should be focusing on is the cerebral perfusion pressure. But measuring cerebral perfusion pressure is very difficult, tiresome and very costly. But we can extrapolate that cerebral perfusion pressure is mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. 
So I can measure the intracranial pressure and I can measure the mean arterial pressure. So basically with this correlation, that is the reason we are focusing on ICP. So when ICP becomes elevated, as you can see, because this is negative, as ICP increases, the cerebral perfusion will be decreased. In normal adults, cerebral perfusion pressure is more than 50. And in fluctuation of the mean arterial pressure, the cerebral perfusion pressure is maintained because of the cerebral autoregulation mechanism we have. So here we are going to discuss a famous philosophy, the Monroe Kelly hypothesis, which states that the skull is basically a closed box containing three components, CSF, blood, and brain tissue. So any change in one of these will be compensated by changing the other. For example, if a mass develops, the initial structure or item that leaves the skull vault will be the CSF through the foramen magnum. If the pressure keeps persisting, then the blood will be affected and then the brain will be affected. Okay, so if we have, you can see the ICP is marked here by dark color and the cerebral perfusion pressure is marked by the red color. As long as the ICP is maintained, the cerebral perfusion pressure will be maintained. The moment intracranial pressure starts to increase, cerebral perfusion pressure starts to decrease. And then at some point T, if the ICP and cerebral perfusion pressure are equal, there will not be any flow of blood into the skull or out of the skull. Basically, it's a stalemate. It will be stuck there. That's the state we call brain death. So what are the causes for raised ICP? I think almost all of you can mention them. These are the possible causes of raised ICP. So, what are the ways to measure intracranial pressure? Because as I said earlier, it's easier to measure intracranial pressure. The gold standard we have is intraventricular catheter placement, also known as external ventricular drain. But mind you, we have intraparenchymal monitors, uh, monitors that are less accurate, but still used are subarachnoid screws, subdural and epidural monitors. So what an external ventricular drain looks like is shown here. So the tip is inserted directly into the ventricle at the level of foramen Monroe and applied directly to a collector. So the pressure we measure from the foramen Monroe, if the patient is lying supine from the external auditory meatus, we measure anything above that is considered as centimeter of water for the ICP. So do we apply intracranial pressure monitor for every patient? No, still experts don't agree. So it depends on the hospital you are practicing. For example, some centers follow patients with neuromonitoring if they don't follow commands, while others follow them only if they don't localize. But most of them agree that if patient is having multi-system injury, especially, for example, if they have abdominal injury and you are going to take them to the OR and put them under general anesthesia, you wouldn't know the state of the GCS for that particular patient. In that case, it will be ideal to insert neuromonitoring. Some physicians still advocate use of neuromonitoring following acute epidural subdural hematoma surgeries. So... What are treatment measures specifically designed for raised intracranial pressure? So our optimal target is not known, by the way. So ICP, specific ICP number for that particular person is not known, but many researches show that the optimal level is more than 20 millimeter of mercury. Always it's better to treat raised ICP early. So again, the optimal cerebral perfusion is not known. And if we keep it less than 50 millimeter of mercury, patients will have associated ischemia. If we have CPP more than 70, patients will develop ARDS. So our target will be you know, to keep it more than 50 millimeter of mercury. So the general measures here 
that's the one of the management options we have for documented rate ICP patients. We need to keep the ICP less than 20 millimeters of mercury. We need to keep cerebral perfusion pressure more than 50. We need to avoid hypoxia. We need to avoid systemic hypotension. These are all we said, starting from the presentation, we are targeting prevention of secondary insult. So direct measures that are targeting the ICP include heavy sedation. Now we have the option of putting the machine on the patient on mechanical ventilator, so we can sedate them as much as we want. If patient has already neuromonitoring or intraventricular catheter, when the ICP is raised too much, we can drain three to five ml and check for the patient's condition. As we are in the ICU, we have monitoring option for partial pressure of carbon dioxide, so we can hyperventilate even some recommend, you know, if we are able to monitor the jugular oxygen saturation or cerebral blood flow rate, we can even put partial carbon dioxide to the level of 25 to 30 millimeter of mercury. Of course, Manitol was started earlier in the peri hospital care, in the emergency care, so it's going to continue in the ICU. But mind you, Manitol should not be used for more than three days. So if we have surgical condition, according to the indication, we need to remove it so that we can control raised intracranial pressure. The other exception will be hemo if there is hemorrhagic contusion. If it is not a locant area and we are having difficulty of controlling the raised ICP, we can directly uh, excise or remove the palpid brain part. And the final option we have for patients with uncontrolled raised ICP is to do decompressive craniotomy. So this is a patient who presented to our hospital with raised ICP. GCS was around 10 on arrival, but in the morning GCS became three. Pupils were dilated. And on the imaging, actually, this is not trauma patients. This was a tumor case. So on the imaging, we saw a temporal tumor. We took him to the OR. We operated, but the moment we opened the dura, there was profuse bleeding, which was uncontrollable from the tumor. So we just basically did the decompressive craniotomy. As you can see, the brain has swollen, the tumor has swollen. We put the bone in the abdomen. And then after some, after awakening, the patient became GCS 15. He walks around in the ward and so on. We did surgery two times and he, He's still currently waiting for replacement of the bone at the surgical site. This is another patient who underwent craniotomy. You can clearly see that the brain is going, how the brain swelling has gone out of the skull vault. So this is a famous engineer with GCS4. We operated on him. He currently is functional and he administers around 500 100 people under him. Okay, so. If we cannot control medically or surgically the raised ICP, we will take control CT scan. Still, we cannot have any management option. We proceed to second tire management. But mind you, second tire treatment should be given only under supervision of uh, intensivist or neurosurgeon because the evidence is not that much and we need to follow patients properly. So one of the second higher management is inducing barbiturate coma. The second line of treatment is hypothermia, decompressive surgery, lumbar drain. Again, you have to watch out for cerebral sac, and we even give hypertensive therapy. So the second one is, as we said earlier, we can hyperventilate up to 25 to 30 millimeter of mercury if we are able to monitor the jugular oxygen tension. So I want to take time, okay? Just give me a few seconds and let me show you this video. So basically, this is a brain abscess patient who underwent craniotomy because it was elegant area. We didn't want to remove the brain part. So we did, we did middle aspiration. And to guide us with our aspiration, we used ultrasound. So basically, this is the brain tissue you see here. So we are irrigating 
into the cavity. You can see it appearing here. So clearly now it's visible. You see this cavity. We are irrigating with gentamicin and saline. So you can see even some of the debris moving around in the abscess cavity. So you can see here, here floating. So we have irrigated, we have inserted saline with gentamicin. Now you will see it collapse when we are aspirating this. I just brought this image to show you at least where we are with neurosurgery in Ethiopia. So basically use, usage of ultrasound in brain surgery is a new concept because uh, they were using neural navigation or MRI, which, has, which are very costly. So, so when we come to the long-term management of irregular patients, doing tracheostomy early prevents tracheal stenosis and it decreases the number of days patients spend on mechanical ventilator. Well, and the moment day seven arrives, we need to change it to metallic and we need to teach the family how to take care of metallic tracheostomy tubes. But mind you, don't discharge patients with tracheostomy and energy tube. They will come to you or they will develop tracheoesophageal fistula. So what's advised is if you think the patient is not gonna awake soon and you are gonna keep the tracheostomy tube for long, just ask the general surgeons to do you gastrostomy or jejunostomy. So deep vein thrombosis in severe TPI, if it's not treated, it is around 20, it accounts 20%. The treatment is very simple. Compression stockings can be applied, heparin can be given, and postoperatively it should be started as soon as 72 hours, or in terms, in cases of intracerebral hemorrhage, it should be started after one week of surgery. So we should keep giving the anticoagulant for three months post-op. In terms of nutritional support, by day seven, head injury patients should be started on full calorie treatment. That means in non-paralyzed patients, 140% of their bazaar energy expenditure, while in paralyzed patients around 100%. We need to provide 15% of their feeding in, term, in protein. And as we said, it should be started. You know, you cannot start directly at day seven with full calorie. So any head injury patient that arrives to you in the emergency, you should start them feeding within 72 hours if you are not gonna take them to the OR. In terms of route of administration, the efficacy or the outcome of intral and IV nutrition is the same, but IV is associated with complication and it's not cost effective, very expensive. So intral route is preferred. The only exception for IV hyperalimentation or parenteral feeding is if we need more higher nitrogen intake or patient is having decreased gastric emptying. So I'm definitely sure you, know, you guys are thinking, well, how can I measure the calorie of the feeding or the food I'm giving these patients? Or how do I calculate it? This is your calculation for you. And hopefully most of you heard about this formula, Mumbai formula. It can be prepared with local findings and 100 ml of it contains 100 calories, 100 kilocalories. So you can calculate accordingly to your patients. So what are the long-term associated conditions? Patient may have post-traumatic hydrocephalus. If it occurs, it is usually associated with poor prognosis. So how do we diagnose elevated intracranial pressure or hydrocephalus? One is by doing lumbar punctures, or we can check for papilledema on the eyes. Patient may complain of headache or pressure symptoms, or we may see on CT scan transipin diamond absorption. The other aspect of long-term management of patients with head injury is joint stiffness and bed sore. So anybody can imagine if the limb is weak, 
hypertonic and there is no sensory input, patient is automatically going to develop PERSOR and TVT. So at the start of admission, we should start them with physiotherapy. We need to give them uh, repositioning every two hours to prevent PERSOR because as most clinicians know that once PERSOR occurs, it's hell. So it's always, always, always better to prevent it rather than deal with any PERSOR. So this is, as you can see, a grade three PERSOR. Other late complications include post-traumatic seizure, communicating a hydrocephalus, as we talked earlier, post-traumatic syndrome or post concussive syndrome. Patients will be forgetful. They will not have prolonged attention span. They may have pituitary insufficiency, and they may have chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and sometimes they end up with dementia. So what are the things we do at our hospital? We also operate on tumors like CPA tumors here. You see vestibular schwannoma patients. This patient was operated post-op. He developed CSF leak the operators, and then he came back with significant improvement. We also do this such large tumors almost if you compare to the brain, it is occupying half of the intracranial space. This is parasagittal meningioma. So I leave you with this question. So what is the summit or the peak of knowledge? So basically, do you really think that I can operate on myself if I have head injury? So all this skill, all this knowledge is not for me only, right? So basically the summit of knowledge should be helping others. So with this in mind, we have started this Telegram and Facebook group. You can join us, it's free consultation. The patient can consult, uh, physicians, the nurses can consult, and we also have patients' testimonials with significant improvement. So you can search for African Miracles. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor, for uh, this amazing presentation. Um, so let's go, let's just dive into the question and answer uh, part of the uh, the virtual seminar. So if you can see your the, the Q&A section of the Zoom, doctor, you can read any questions uh, you, you like and you can give answers to those. And participants, if you have any uh, questions related to the subject matter, you can write it in the Q&A so, uh, section. Okay, so I, I, I think I don't have to type it. I just need to tell you yeah. the answer. So yes, yes. Why the exposure containing IV fluids are better avoided because you can see that more of they have free water. The exposure containing fluids have more of free water. So we are dealing with cerebral edema. We want to resolve that issue, right? So by giving more free water, you are just exacerbating the cerebral edema. So in patients with confirmed raised ICP, the use of ketamine is still controversial. It may be combined with propofol. As you can imagine, propofol causes uh, hypotension. So by combining it with ketamine, you may use it together. But ideally, it's better to avoid ketamine in head injury patients. So I verbal motor from I motor verbal motor during GCS score, which one is most important patient prognostic? So the thing about GCS is it's not objective, you know, like it's not objective. I mean, like one does not equal to one. That means I cannot have, for example, GCS with motor six and I opening one or motor six verbal one. It's not possible, it's not objective. It is basically subjective and it is additive. You get my point? So eye opening cannot be considered alone or motor cannot be considered alone. But if you really, really have to choose, 
maybe motor may be chosen, but be careful about that because you cannot have a patient where you have six motor and eye opening is one from head injury. So the next question, is there a controversy on the use of ketamine for TBI patients because ketamine increases the mean arterial pressure and further increases ICP? I think I have already answered this question earlier. So we, we can use it combined with propofol. Otherwise, the use of ketamine for TBI patients is not 100% supported. Can we use other methods like AV AVPU for trauma patients in a pre-hospital setting to assess neurologic status. What is the correlation? So AVPU can be used, no problem. It is faster and uh, it's faster, it's able to communicate, but in terms of objectivity, that's, you know, as a neurosurgeon, I'm not comfortable using this uh, awake uh, and so on and so on. Criteria. I prefer the last coma scale because I can follow the numbers. And as I said earlier, if there is any disease drop by two or three, I can intervene. You know, this one is not as clear or objective as the uh, last coma scale. But again, this one, especially in cases of emergency, you want to communicate fast, you want to evaluate faster, it has its advantage over there. Is there a way to assess the integrity of brain blood barrier before administering the manitol. So basically, if you really think about it, let's say the patient has intracerebral hemorrhage. Can we say the blood brain barrier is intact? I think we cannot say that, right? Because already the blood vessel is injured and it's bleeding into the brain, right? But specifically, there is no designed way of knowing if manitol is gonna cross the blood brain barrier and so forth and so forth. In earlier times, you know, while I was a, an intern, there was a research that came out saying that patients with hemorrhagic stroke or intracerebral hemorrhage should not be given manitol because manitol comes out of through the vessels and accumulates in the intracerebral hemorrhage or in the hematoma cavity and starts to even induce edema. But this was again studied and ruled out. So we can use manitol unless the patient's hypotensive renal failure or smolarity is high. As I mentioned earlier, it is not contraindicated. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. I want to know if prophylactic manitol has a role in severe TBI and is there a disagreement with prophylactic antibiotics for meningitis in basal skull fracture? Thank you again. Okay, thank you very much, Malaku. So in terms of prophylactic use, the problem with prophylactic use is, you know, what is your criteria? What, what should the patient fulfill for you to use it prophylactically? Okay, so ideally, that's why I clearly brought manitol as an issue. There should be clear indication for manitol. There should be clearly documented raised ICP in terms of imaging or clinical condition of the patient or neuromonitoring to have raised ICP for us to use manitol. So prophylactic use of manitol is not advised. In terms of basal skull fracture and meningitis, the use of antibiotics, current recommendation is for basal skull fractures, antibiotics is not used prophylactically. The science or the logic behind is that, you know, the CSF is directly coming out, it's not sucking in. So the chance it's continuously washing the wound or the CSF leak site. So the philosophy here is that the bacteria that gets washed away from the skull or from the brain rather than getting sucked in. So antibiotic use, prophylactic antibiotic use for basal skull fractures is currently not practiced. Why don't we use manitol for more than three days? Very simple answer. It reverses its effect. Okay, As we said earlier, if you remember, it sets a new uh, concentration level or tonicity, right? But if we use it for more than 
three days, the cerebral edema is the osmotic gradient between the cerebral edema or in the cerebellum and the vasculature will be the same. So it will not benefit us anymore. Okay, we have another question from Wenderson. Would you recommend a general surgeon to do exploratory bear hole in a hospital with no CT scan and ICU for patients who can't afford to visit a neurosurgical center? This is an excellent question. Probably Wenderson is planning to become a general surgeon or he knows a surgeon who is practicing this. Oh, you know, like what are your patients? should be transferred to specialty center as soon as possible, we said earlier, right? But uh, we, I know the setup, trust me, I have worked in many places and I have seen the worst scenarios. That's the question is, how familiar is the general surgeon with doing exploratory bar holes? That's my question for you. So if the person is comfortable, well-trained, he has good neurosurgical attachment during his residency, I don't see any contraindication in saving life of a patient where there is nothing. But the, the real question is, has he experienced it or has he seen bear holes or has he done bear holes properly? Does he know the steps? For example, the first bear hole you do is on the left, on the temporal side. So this criteria should be known. The second bar hole you do is the contralateral temporal side. Most surgeons I know who do exploratory bar hole just want to do on one side only. Try the temporal, parietal, frontal, occipital, and finally the posterior fossa, and then they go back to the contralateral side. But according to the guidelines, it should be you know temporal first, bilaterally, and then you go ahead. So I wonder if the general surgeon realizes this and practices like this. Okay, Hibst is asking us very informative update. Thank you, okay. We also thank you. Is prophylactic antibiotic indicator in EVD? Oh, this question, even I did, uh, my graduation thesis was on EVD on patients in Black Lion Hospital in low income setup. We basically use energy tube and urine bag as an EVD. It's not as advanced as on the picture I showed you earlier. And it has clearly shown there is no benefit of using antibiotic, even uh, prophylactically before surgery, after surgery and so on, unless there is confirmed infection. But most of the time as a practicing physicians, we treat ourselves and we keep giving them antibiotics. But ideally the only confirmed type of EVD is if the EVD itself is antibiotic impregnated, it prevents or it decreases the risk of infection in meningitis. So I think uh, Dr. Lamroth is asking us how we manage the pain. I think this is analgesic uh, director question. I think as any physician, you know that you start with paracetamol and then proceed with diclofenac, then proceed with tramadol, and then finally we start them on opioids, morphine, petidine, up to fentanyl. I think this is standard question, not directly re related to head injury. Robil, I also thank you very much. So how do we tap permanitol? That's an excellent question, which my presentation missed it. So basically, after day three, we start missing one dose. So basically we, we give it TID, 100 TID. So we start uh, losing one dose per day or over two days. And then finally stop it on day six or day five. Is manitol still recommended as a continuous dosing as opposed to bolus only? So uh, it depends on the benefit you want to get from manitol. In terms of head injury, I want you to understand that I want it fast, you know. The moment you start manitol, in five minutes, you can see some changes on your patient. So automatically, rather than continuous infusion, we need to focus on specifically talking about head injury. We need to give it in bolus, okay, so that we benefit. Because as I said earlier, 
most of the time we are giving the money tool to buy us time, patient is deteriorating, to check for such variability. Uh, for example, let's say I want to take the patient to the OR or the patient has deteriorated. Do you really think continuous dosing, waiting for one hour of monitor will benefit the patient or give him over 20 minutes? And then whenever OR is available, taking the patient into the OR. Okay, Marcos, we thank you also. What is hypertensive agents? So, Jonas, you are really paying attention to my presentation. So the ones we use are, as I said, uh, noradrenaline is the preferred one, hypertensive agent. The other one we use is, yeah. sorry, I, I forgot that drug, but mainly noradrenaline is the one, at least on our daily practice we use. So I think your question is regarding second tire management in the Last part, I said hypertensive treatment. So as I told you earlier, second higher management is, you know, you are desperate, you have operated on your patient, you have given them manitol, you have given them Lasix or Frosamide, but the patient is still suffering from ICP, or uh, that's the problem. So what we do is basically, we, we induce hypertension so that our cerebral perfusion pressure will be more than 50 or the one that reaches into the brain is higher so but for this we need a very advanced setup is there any absolute indication for elevation of midline DSF? of course for example let's say the patient has depressed skull fracture it's midline and the patient has neurologic deficit usually you know if you remember your homonucleus near the parasagittal area, it is the lower limbs that are represented. And if there is significant midline depressed skull fracture, the patient will be paraplegic. I think we should operate in that case. Let's say the midline DSF is compound, there is blood oozing through the wound, I think we should operate. You know, I don't want you guys to think in terms of which ones not to operate, which ones to operate. Rather, where to operate, you see? There should be, you know, adequate expertise in handling midline DSF, okay? It should be the most senior neurosurgeon that operates on midline DSFs. You, you should prepare at least four units of platelet, four units of blood, four units of fresh frozen plasma. And you should have a good communication with your anesthesiologist. Ideally, they should secure you arterial line or multiple venous lines. In that case, you can directly operate. Okay, Marcos, thank you very much. Sisa is asking us indications to operate in subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I may ask you back, are you asking me about spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage or traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage? Because in most of the time, traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage does not require surgery. I just brought you the image because there is associated DSF, epidural, and so on. That's why the patient is operated. On the other hand, if there is a spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, the first thing that should come to your mind is aneurysm. And if an, it's an aneurysm rupture, as I showed you earlier in the anatomy, the vessels are located in the subarachnoid space the major big vessels. So if they bleed due to aneurysm, we are gonna have subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay. So Ganesh is asking us, for how long do we continue anti-epileptic in post-traumatic seizure? It depends, as I said earlier, if it is early for prophylaxis early, only seven days. We don't use it for post-traumatic cases, except in cases of penetrating brain injury, alcohol intoxicated patient, patient with previous history of seizure disorder or patients who had seizure. In those cases, we need to give them six to 12 months, do EEG and confirm it. How does pneumothorax aggravate an increase in ICP? This is basic physiologic question. So if I have pneumothorax, venous return from the superior vena cava will be reduced. 
that back pressure will go to the jugular vein, that back pressure goes into the brain. So basically, this is the same logic as applying a very tight neck collar. If we apply like that, the venous return towards the superior vena cava will be reduced, right? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marcos. Okay. I'm really sorry to interrupt you. So okay. let's speak uh, last uh, one or two questions. One, uh, you can choose one uh, who is uh, which is really important to address and we can address it and uh, let's conclude the Q&A session. Okay, thank you very much. So I like uh, Hanan's question. I think the other two have been answered by my presentation already. How do you load phenytoin in TBI patients? Some say we can give it 1000 milligrams, some say 300 milligrams every three hours, which one is correct? So basically, if we are giving 1000 milligram directly, patient may develop side effects. Okay, so ideally, rather than every three hours, you know, if you make it every six hours, the patient will have time, you know, in 24 hours, you have given them uh, around every six hours, you have given them almost 1000 milligram and then you can start 100 dead. So you are not giving the phenytoin to directly stop the current seizure. If the patient is having seizure, you are giving with diazepam or midazolam, you are using to stop the seizure, okay? So it's prophylaxis, it will take time. So directly trying to apply 1000 milligram is risky. Unless you have IV in that case, maybe it's safer. All right, thank you so much, uh, doctor. Uh, I think we're, we're getting a lot of uh, thank yous from the, from the chat section also. Uh, everybody really uh, loved your uh, presentation. If you have any last words, uh, I can give you the stage and it's already late. Uh, we've taken your time already. We can conclude uh, here. So thank you very much. I think my last words will be, you know, most of you are general practitioners and I really tell you that even though you are passing through hard times, keep practicing. As I told you, the reason that I brought that our point is that the most knowledgeable person is not for himself, it's for others. Okay? Unless the society understands that, you will be suffering for some time. But I tell you, keep sticking to your practice. Things will improve in the future. 